Hello and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. Today we begin a study of the constitutions of the Discalced Carmelite Order as written by St. Teresa of Avila. We will begin this study with an introduction that was written by a former Carmelite friar by the name of Kieran Cavanaugh. He is since deceased. Let us begin. Introduction. The contribution of St. Teresa to spiritual literature has received universal recognition. As a mother foundress, Teresa also stands out for her practicality and talent in having maintained the highest spiritual life amid everyday conflicts that arose particularly from the material and personal needs of the nuns in her new communities. But one of her accomplishments, revealing another facet of her talents, is her work as legislator for her new Carmels. Petitioned Rome. When Teresa petitioned Rome for the permission to found the monastery of St. Joseph in Avila, she only had a general plan in mind. In the reply from Rome in February of 1562, the brief granted her the power to make statutes and ordinances in conformity with canon law, along with the right to change these for the better or eliminate them entirely according to the condition of the times or to make new ones. Teresa needed these powers because the constitutions in use at the Incarnation Monastery, where she had come from, would just not have served the kind of life she envisioned in which the primitive rule of Carmel was to be observed. Neither did there exist within the order any other constitutions for monasteries of nuns as observing the primitive rule first steps. It seems the first steps taken toward the drawing up of the constitutions are found in Teresa's account of her first foundation in her life. She writes, now although there is some austerity because meat is never eaten without necessity and there is an eight-month fast and other things as are seen in the first rule, This is still in many respects considered small by the sisters, and they have other observances which seem to us necessary in order to observe the rule with greater perfection. Teresa wrote these words after some three years' experience with the new life at St. Joseph's in Avila. The other observances referred to introduce to keep the rule with greater perfection, formed, no doubt, the nucleus of the constitutions. The first years must have served as experimental ones. Maria de San Jose supports this when she says that Teresa preferred first to experiment before presenting anything for approval as law. Another of the early nuns, Maria de San Geronimo testified that if a religious introduced a practice of penance or mortifications, Teresa wanted to be the first one to try it out. First draft and approval. By the time Teresa wrote her first draft of the Way of Perfection in 1566, a year after she had completed the book of her life, She was able to refer explicitly to the constitutions. Some existed in some, so some existed in written form. When in 1567, the prior General Rubio visited Avila, Teresa was able to show him the text of her constitutions and seek his approval of them. The provincial of the Carmelites in Castile, Angel de Salazar, has left us a testimony that Rubio saw and approved Teresa's constitutions.
This approval came as the culmination of the quiet and restful years of Teresa's life, the first five years at St. Joseph's in Avila. Original text and friars. The text shown Rubio has not been preserved, but the Teresian constitutions that have been preserved legislate not only for a single monastery in Avila, but for a number of Carmels. We, however, have some idea of the first text when looking at the text for the friars followed in Durello. These constitutions were obviously copied with certain adaptations. From Teresa's first constitutions, deduced from the brevity of the text and the occasional lapses where the author neglected to change the gender from feminine to masculine. These constitutions for the friars were sent to the prior general for his approval and then placed in the general archives of the Carmelites of, a, of the observance in Rome. The text is simple and sparse, indicating that she, who when speaking of prayer was often extravagant with words, was very frugal with them when writing laws. Autograph for her nuns. As for Teresa's constitutions for her nuns, the oldest text preserved is an expansion of the first constitutions and speaks of Carmels in the plural and of lay sisters. It represents a stage in an evolving process. The autograph of the text conserved in the general archives of the Spanish Congregation of Discalced Carmelites in Madrid was lost in the last century. Fortunately, a copy of this lost autograph has been made for the general archives of the Portuguese con congregation. Another copy of these early constitutions is preserved in the monastery of nuns of the primitive rule of Carmel, founded by Maria de Jesus in Alcala. A third copy comes from one of the first historians of the order, Geronimo de San Jose. From various ancient copies of these constitutions, Padre Geronimo constructed his own text published in 1635. Editors of Teresa's works have been made different choices with respect to these copies. When compared with what one can estimate concerning the first text for St. Joseph's alone, this latter text shows an increase in length of little over a half, due mainly to a penal code certainly not authored by Teresa, and surely taken from some version of already existing Carmelite constitutions, which Teresa simply accepted, as this section does not represent Teresa's mentality at all or her style. Two major sections. The first section deals with the daily schedule and the way of life of the new family. The second section with the penal discipline required in religious codes of the time. These two sections are followed by an epilogue and two more prescriptions that are out of place, surely drafted later. The first section. This part, written by Teresa, is simple and balanced. There is no intention here of inserting her spiritual laws. She simply drew up some general guidelines for community life. The spiritual commentary on her constitutions must be sought principally in the way of perfection. What stands out in these guidelines for Teresian life is balance. We find an interweaving of work and contemplation, solitude and community, of liturgical and extra-liturgical prayer. Even the apostolic life is integrated into the contemplative life in conversations, in prayers and penances. The practice of asceticism and enclosure 
are tempered by a family spirit and by gardens and pleasant views. In receiving and educating novices, stress must be placed on prayer and virtue. Only persons of prayer should be admitted into the postulancy. Contemplative life. In tracing Teresa's program of contemplative life, Teresa, without a doubt, took into consideration the primitive Carmelite rule as well as the Carmelite constitutions then in force. She did so independently, though, refusing to tone down the new spirit that issued from her own extraordinary life of prayer. In fact, she reacted against a whole gamut of practices observed in her former monastery. Even in regard to the Carmelite rule, she allows herself a certain freedom. With the law as important as the great silence, which she reformed, so as to make room for evening recreation, she says almost everything is set up in conformity with our rule, intimating her role as legislator. As legislator, that means rule maker, she uh, was also, in fact, the prioress, and thus, understandably, the mother prioress should be the first on the list for sweeping the floor. As for her own method of governing and the spirit in which she wrote her laws, these things should be done with a mother's love. Exceptions to the rule. As Teresa went on founding her new Carmels, she found she had to make exception to, to the rules. Copied, multipl copies multiplied. As Carmels multiplied, copies of the constitutions multiplied. And as these multiplied, fidelity to the original text diminished. There were prioresses who found absolutely no problem whatsoever in adding or admitting whatever seemed suitable to them. The appointment in 1569 of apostolic visitators for the Carmel affected Teresa's Carmels as well. It is sufficient to fulfill the obligation set by the church without imposing another on top of it, as nuns tend to get very scrupulous, that means obsessive, which harms them. More rules. In September of 1576, a new monitor for the friars was named. Teresa learned that he would also be monitoring the houses of her nuns. She reacted strongly in a letter to Grazian. This is what my nuns fear, that overbearing superiors will come along and they will crush them. Just reading these new regulations really tires me out. What would I do if I really had to follow them? On the whole, it must be admitted that the apostolic visitators did respect Teresa's views and they did consult with her, issuing no orders without her knowledge. The church itself was in a state of reform after the Council of Trent, and the religious orders had to incorporate the new law that had been drawn up, such as the new rules regarding cloister, discalced independence. Teresa desired a clearer presentation of all of this legislation. Her chance came at the chapter of 1580, when Celts, that's the traditional Carmelites, would form their own province, and the new provincial, Grazian, would legislate for the nuns. Teresa makes a few recommendations. She wanted one body of law and some other changes. She also gave a voice to the houses, reviewing their suggestions for change before sending them along to her provincial, Grazian. The resulting constitutions are nowadays referred to as the constitutions of Alcala, completed in 1581. Teresa, a woman lawmaker. In a letter about these constitutions, 
Gratian, the provincial of the Theresian order, does not mention Teresa as the author, the main author and source of these constitutions of Alcala. Why, you may ask? Well, probably because in the mind of the men involved, it was just simply not feasible to include a woman among the lawmakers of the order. The first constitutions drafted for St. Joseph in Avila amounted to about 13 pages, the later ones considerably more. But since they were not drafted by Teresa, editors usually do not include them among her complete works as they don't represent Teresa's final word. Scholars are just not in agreement as to how well the constitutions of Alcala represent the mind and the wishes of our mother founders, Teresa of Avila. Teresa's Constitutions in Print. What made Mother Founders happy when she received the Alcala Constitutions was that she finally had an established and approved document with the signatures she most desired. And now she wanted them in print. The first edition in pocket size appeared in 1581 in Salamanca. The Constitution of Alcala remained in force for no more than a decade, only 10 years. When the first supply of copies was exhausted, as the number of the Carmels increased in Spain, Ana de Jesus had them reprinted in Madrid in 1588. Two years later, they were approved by Pope Sixtus V and published in Latin in Rome. But in 1592, the Vicar General of the Spanish Congregation of Discalced Carmelites denied that these constitutions of Avila were Teresa's constitutions, and he changed them. He subsequently obtained papal approval for his own version. From then on, the constitutions of Alcala were never again used as law in the order. Though Anna de Jesus brought them to France, and they continue to be published in French translations. Teresa's Completed Works it wasn't until the second half of the last century that Teresa's earlier constitutions were given a place in her completed works. Our translation is of the earlier text of Teresa's constitution and follows the one made for the Portuguese congregation from the autograph that is now missing. This text is also used by the great scholar Thomas Alvarez and Fortunato and Tolan in their critical editions. Thank you for listening. Amen. So as we continue with this study, I've decided that I am not going to make a summary of the constitutions as I've been doing with Teresa's um, other works. I'm just going to read these constitutions. I'm not going to modify them in any way. So you'll have them exactly as they were translated from Spanish. So thank you so much for following along and for listening and for discovering the Discalced Order of Carmelites. Amen.